Ladies and gentlemen, as part of the ongoing Mayo College Vintage Car Rally, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished guests and esteemed audience to this exciting evening. The Mayo College Vintage Car Rally is an initiative taken by the Automobile Society of the College, Auto Mayo. It is through this event that the society wants to instill passion and interest for automobiles in young Mayoites. This evening, we have distinguished experts amidst us who will be talking to us about restoration and automobiles. I would now like to invite Arjav Mendiratta to introduce the guest speakers to you. Good evening, everyone. It is my proud privilege to introduce the guest speakers for the evening. Mr. Tutu Dhawan, Mr. Avijit Singh Bandor, and Mr. Alan Almeida. I request Somal, Devrat, and Laksharaj to present bouquets to the distinguished speakers. The first speaker for the evening is Mr. Tutu Dhawan. A well-known name in the world of automobiles, Mr. Dhawan was a national champion in the 1985 Himalayan Rally and is the first Indian to finish fourth overall. In the Great Hit Desert Himalaya Raid, which is the most challenging rally in the world after the Paris Dakar Rally, not only did he finish first in the category of light commercial vehicles, but also to achieve record timings in competitive sections like Leh to Srinagar via Kargil, covering a total distance of 440 kilometers in 5 hours and 13 minutes. In the world of automobile, on both domestic and international front, he is a known figure and contributes regularly to the Hindu Times of India, India Today Plus, Outlook, Overdrive and other prominent lifestyle magazines. He is the founder and former president of Heritage Motoring Club of India, a vintage and classic cars club in Delhi. He is also the regional director of Federation of Motor Sports Clubs of India and the chairman of PCRT. We welcome you, sir. May I now invite Mr. Dhawan to address the audience. Let's welcome him with a huge round of applause. Honorable Principal, Madam, and our Honorable uh, Board of the Mayo College, young boys, and welcome you, and good evening to all of you. I don't want to uh, talk too much about the history and all of uh, automobiles and things. I guess everybody knows, but I can only tell you uh, a few things about vintage and classic cars which have got evolved in the last 50, 60 years. Before that, yes, these cars were our daily use vehicles for people of that era and there was not much ado about the, these vehicles. They were like what we have today, uh, Maruti and Hyundai and Honda and so on and so forth. So these were those days common vehicles. Yes, of course, there were some which was affordable to the general masses and then there were some which was made for the elite. And then of course, the best which were made to order. And those vehicles were primarily uh, on order by dignitaries and chief of heads and states, uh, rajas, maharajas, kings, queens and so on. So they had their own uh, facet for having a vehicle for what they want. There were some 
<coughs> which ha had the cars for the coronation only. And I know of one uh, 1918 Rolls Royce, which had done only 4,000 miles till about 20 years back when I saw, <coughs> last saw it. And now I think that car is with one of our big collectors got it and still doesn't have more than maybe another 1,500 kilometers of miles on it. Like that you had uh, shikar vehicles, you had coronation vehicles, you had ceremonial vehicles and then there was the famous Maharaja of Kashmir, uh, uh, Sir um, Hari Singh Ji Maharaj, who was very fond of having Rolls Royces. He had a total of 36 Rolls Royces out of which 35 of them could only achieve a top speed of 80 miles. And he had a fetish for driving his vehicle up to 100 miles. So he ordered one car from Rolls Royce as uh, something that they could de decide and de uh, design with the result it could reach 100 miles now. Rolls Royce took on that challenge. And in those era, it was in 1927, I'm talking of. In those days, uh, Rolls Royce was making Phantom, Phantom One. So they converted a Phantom One, made it narrower by eight inches from the sides, made it more aerodynamic, had flaring uh, fenders, front and rear, and had a boat tail at the back to give it the aerodynamic uh, to the body and the rear seat of course it was a four seater but when the time came for racing you could fold the cover the four seats uh, two seats at the back and also you could open the front windscreen upwards so that it could not be a drag on the vehicle I'm sure the boys would understand what the meaning of drag is and that car was finally able to do 100 miles an hour. That iconic car, some 35, 40 years back, got sold to a collector in Calcutta. And over the years, uh, I think it deteriorated. It couldn't be looked after well the way it was. And it got sold to somebody who finally smuggled it out of India. And that car, was restored abroad. Uh, I don't know the place, but it is now running uh, in Sweden. And it is impeccable. And the same car with the same specs, we are trying to replicate here one in India for a gentleman collector. So what I am trying to say is, we have, I have specially seen multiple errors of how these cars have come up. I have also looked after these cars when they were just like an ordinary uh, machine for the house, domestic use and office use. And you would, we would get spares and we could have uh, people to work on and all those things were available. And over the period of time, these cars became unpractical to be driven with the type of road conditions and traffic conditions that have come up in the last 30, 40 years. So they slowly and slowly started going back into the garages and the preference used to be the last to take them out. Uh, it could be on a ceremonial day or sometime on weekend with Saturdays, Sundays, the family drive going uh, out of town so that you know you would get fresh air. These cars uh, had genuinely a problem of ventilation and they were not tropicalized for our Indian conditions and we were all trying to uh, do some sort of a modification what we call it a jugaad today that's the type of modification we were trying to do and make them run finally a, a time came in the last 10-12 years when these cars could not be driven on our uh, metros especially with the type of traffic on the uh, traffic lights and so on. So these cars went slowly and slowly back and now you see them. Today I think you've already seen 
some of them here on display. And these are of course very iconic cards. All have got their own individual uh, identities. Not unlike today, every card today looks like an elongated bubble with a badge sticking on it and you can probably keep switching one badge from one car to the other and you won't know if it's the same make or not. But in those days, one could identify a car by just having a glimpse as to what it is, which company it is. There were some cars which were uh, heavily engineered, made specifically for the upper class and they had very, uh, I would say, less com uh, orders and they had a, a top heavy management and engineering and finally those companies could not last long but they make some beautiful iconic cars which is now left for us to cherish and imagine what the uh, era of that time did to engineering. They were highly over-engineered, highly over-engineered is not the word because I'll just give one small incidence. A six-cylinder engine of that era would weigh at least 200 plus kgs and take out not more than 50 to 60 bhp, brake horsepower. And as compared to uh, a modern engine, taking out uh, 60, 70 bhp is a 800 cc engine or a 1000 cc engine which could do the same job. So one can very well imagine where the refinement of engineering has reached. Today we have gone into a micro mechanism of almost every aspect of engineering and so for the automobiles as well. <clears throat> one had not even heard or dreamt of the fact that computers will one day be not only managing the um, administrative of our countries and all, but they would also be managing the, the, the running of the automobiles. Today, 99% of automobiles, they all have computers on board and sometimes not one, maybe 40, 50, 60 of these small uh, PCBs which are installed on every small little gadget inside a car and in uh, and then they have the mother computer which is uh, uh, being governing all the controls of the vehicle. So that's the sort of engineering feat we have reached. Today we, I'm talking of now restoration and as I started the topic by saying that I have seen all those days when restoration was not a big deal but now it has actually become uh, quite a challenge. Challenge for on two reasons. One is the challenge for repairing and getting no uh, manufacturing help. So if one has to make use of today's technology and the internet to be able to get all the information that one wants. And then of course try to source the spares. Some companies have started making replica spares <coughs> for their own product and some have outsourced them. So with the result, there are a lot of companies abroad in Europe and in America which are doing this very seriously and giving all sorts of uh, equipment and parts. Of course, uh, they, are, they may not, they, their uh, working mechanism may be a little questionable in terms of durability and preciseness. But uh, nevertheless, I mean today, uh, that uh, benefit of making something, sitting on your chair and identifying where it is available and finally ordering it and getting it <coughs> through the exchange route normally uh, what is allowed by the government. But there was a time when these things were not available and one had to be creative. Creative to the extent of making almost or replicating almost every little item on the car, which included the mechanism as well as the body and the ornaments. The ornaments are the most difficult ones because it's the chrome work and the finish and the uh, 
the blending of the uh, ornaments onto the body which actually give you the uh, aesthetics and the look of the of the vehicle so those were the most difficult parts there were some very fine craftsmen of the olden days who used to do all this work by hand there were no machines excuse me there were no machines and everything was done purely by hand that art is going that and those artists are now becoming lesser by the day and i am sure give another decade or two you one may not be able to find those artists at more but yes by the time that stage comes i am sure there would be manufacturers who would probably be able to replicate things and give it to you like what uh, most manufacturers are trying to do for uh, these cars so that's what the small little uh, introduction to you i can give you in terms of replicating restoring cars and of course maintaining i can also tell you that some modern new engineering can be incorporated in these old vehicles some things have been allowed uh, internationally that one could add on for instance the generators now in the good old days we had dynamos and dynamos would not charge a battery uh, till the vehicle reach maybe 50 and 60 kilometers an hour only then it would give sufficient charge by which you could probably switch on the headlamps and not run the battery down but that was not necessary it was those dynamos they did not perform so well that they could do both run the car and the headlights you couldn't do both or simultaneously and in some cases the smart drivers on slow running they would run it on a parking lamp and or on the crossing they would switch off and then again they would switch on and go on so now to replace that anomaly uh, alternators are allowed so alternator can be fitted onto it and today an alternator does work on even on idling an engine which is done running at 1000 rpm it does not need uh, the lights to be switched off similarly for the cooling system which of course now with the traffic conditions which has become really bad they have also allowed that you could put on electric cooling as a help to or to boost the original cooling system in the good old days there were only a propeller fan which used to run off the fan belt in right in the center of the engine which would suck whatever possible it could from the end, uh, radiator to cool the water system but today you could put in a shroud you could have multiple fins on the fan and also you could have an electric fan to <coughs> boost the cooling with the result the car becomes usable also for the braking system in the good old days you know the you had only a single master cylinder which would operate the all the four wheels now that problem or that uh, engineering was a little dicey because if by chance any one little leakage which comes up in the braking system one would have a complete brake fail so to remedy that the modern technology came out with a fail safe braking system with the result in the master cylinder itself what uh, produces the pressure to stop the brakes there are two master cylinders in tandem and both work uh, simultaneously and two wheels uh, get caught by one and the other two wheels by the other master cylinder so with the result what for bit if there is an any uh, in reality where you would have a leak in the brake system the car would still stop it would not be a complete failure so like that there are a lot of uh, uh, reliefs which have been offered to these old vehicles which can be modified legally and you could enter those vehicles in competitions and they will not be disqualified because of these alterations however when you enter a, a vehicle for a competition or an exhibition let me tell you the best vehicle is that 
which is at least 100% original looking, if not original. So if you have been smart to be able to produce a vehicle back to its 100% original condition and the judges are also foxed by the workmanship, you are a winner. 100% you are a winner. So that's the sort of technology that is now being used and fine craftsmanship uh, to reproduce these old vehicles. And these vehicles are now becoming priceless. What used to cost only a few thousand bucks four decades back, five decades back, now cost only a few lakhs. So that's the sort of uh, exchange value you have in five, six decades of how these vehicles have appreciated and how they are going to be appreciating in the future as well. These are becoming rare and they are all becoming collector, collector's items. Depending on the, uh, on the uh, scale of economy, I would say, purchase power. There are cars that you could buy, a fully done up car for about 10, 12 lakhs and there are some which you can buy for maybe 10 crores or maybe five, 15 crores or even 100 crores. So that's, there is, the sky is the limit for that. So <clears throat> that's the sort of uh, differentiation we have now as far as these vintage and uh, classic cars are concerned and they are becoming priceless in their uh, values depending on the rarity of the vehicle and the style and uh, name and heritage of the vehicle. I think I will now say thank you to you all for having listened to me. I hope I am able to give you enough gyan that I have. Thank you. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I just uh, <laughs> forgot to do this little honor that I had to. Uh, this is just a process of how restoration is done. I'll just give you a small little uh, PPT on this and explain to you how, uh, how the process of restoration starts. This is a vehicle which has come for restoration. It came all the way from the SAM dug into the ground for maybe 30, 40, 50 years and this is all that is left of it. You can only see just a part of the bonnet, there is no body. And <clears throat> since, since this car is, is in such a bad and poor shape, we thought it may be better that we make a new one rather than trying to restore this one and take out whatever restorable stuff that is in this vehicle that would be used in that. So we started off with the ladder frame chassis. This is the ladder frame chassis that has been made in-house. This has been made from a sheet and from a 4mm sheet it has been pressed on a mechanical press, a hydraulic mechanical press and made into a C-section which has obviously now got shapes and been uh, inter joined by cross members and welded back uh, with electric uh, power. Both the frames, the left one is the basic frame, the right one that you see is now getting ready to get uh, the mechanism onto it. This is the body frame, especially the passenger area that is being made on the uh, on the ladder frame itself. This is the firewall where uh, where the engine ends and the passenger area starts. You can see both are the, from the front end. So that means the area that you are watching is where the engine sits in. And this is a repeat of the chassis. Now the chassis has got wheels, the front suspension, the braking system and also the rear suspension with its wheels. And the body is now getting <coughs> made. The 
engine finally getting back into the body. This is the uh, steering wheel being manufactured in house. Now, all these things are being replicated 100% to what the specs of this vehicle are. Else, you know, getting a modern steering wheel and putting onto is no big deal. But since the ideology and the ethics is of retaining this originality and also giving back the same look, one had to replicate that. And this is being done purely from the photographs. There are no technical specs to it, but there are photographs. And then, of course, it's your own um, engineering mind which takes out the dimensions and you have to accordingly make. <coughs> this is the ring of the steering wheel and, and the boss there it goes and sits on the steering rod. This what you see is a fiberglass cowl of the steering wheel where what you see where you can press and put the horn button on to it. This is uh, the casting of that in fiberglass. Finally, the steering wheel has got some shape. <clears throat> it's got a wooden uh, lining all around and the wooden lining is not solid wood which has been pasted on. There are strips of wood which are 8 millimeter thick and maybe <clears throat> 30 millimeter wide which have been put into water, made soft and then bound on to this I hope I have another photograph to show you how that is being done. This is the manifold where we are uh, making uh, a multi-carburetor uh, multi, uh, engine. The engine that we are using is from a modern car. It is from the Isuzu. It's a four-cylinder with a single carburetor. And we are putting a twin carb with the result you have to make your own mountings for the manifold. The front facade grill, this is, these are the strips which are coming up for that and they have now, after being made, they have been chromium plated and will be assembled to make it look like into a grill. Fine. <clears throat> this is the front grill that is now being assembled along with the cowl uh, of the uh, fascia. So that means these strips that you see are what uh, you just seen as finished, these are the semi-finished ones. Once they are all put on to it, then it goes for finishing. Passenger area with the transmission. <coughs> the engine <coughs> sitting inside now and also connected to the wheels through the transmission. And this is actually just a radiator which is running short, otherwise it's a driving, drivable chassis. The final product looks something like this. And the final owner obviously is the left side gentleman you may have all seen in Pathan. Thank you. Allow me to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Avijit Singh Badnor. Mr. Avijit Singh Badnor is a college monitor from batch of 1999. He represented Mayo in swimming and water polo at nationals. A hotelier by profession, Mr. Badnor is a keen classic car and motorcycle collector and a major proponent of the movement in Rajasthan. Hailing from the royal family of Badnor, he inherited his passion for classic cars from his father, who is a collector and a major advocate of the hobby in India. 
He serves as the secretary of the Rajputana Automotive Sports Car Club based in Rajasthan. The club has been organizing the vintage and classic car rally for the last 20 years and he has been a key figure in organizing this event. Mr. Bandha also serves as an executive committee member of the Heritage Motoring Club of India and works extensively towards the rights of vintage and classic car owners. He is the director of the newly formed auction house Historic Auctions which is a company primarily focusing on vintage and classic vehicles and memorabilia auctions. After completing his MBA from IMI New Delhi, he has worked with Mercedes-Benz and was the first electric two-wheeler dealer in Rajasthan. He has written various articles for the car magazine Auto India. He is passionate about automobiles and a major portion of his collection of heritage cars includes coupes and convertibles. We welcome you sir. Alan Almeida from Bombay, a marine and mechanical engineer, one of India's finest restorers. His restored cars have participated in all of the world's prestigious Concours de Elegances and have won awards there as well, including the most famous Pebble Beach Concours de Elegance. I would like to invite both Mr. Abhijit Singh Badnor and Mr. Alan Almeida to the stage for the talk. Good evening everyone, director sir, ma'am, old boys, teachers, Pradyuman, Arjav and to be old boys if I, may all, if I may call all of you. So I'm going to brush up very very fast and then we'll take on some questions. Although I was hoping that you would probably would have witnessed the cars and they would have seen the cars and then the questions would have been taken. So, uh, we are going to look at the presentation now. Cars, a word which excites all of us. I am sure every person sitting here loves cars. There can't be anybody who doesn't love cars. It could be new cars, it could be vintage cars, it could be antique cars, it could be jeeps, it could be bikes. But everybody loves them. So, I am going to explain how the vintage and the heritage car scenario works. So, they are divided into about four categories. The Edwardian, which is 19, 18 and earlier. Then we have the vintage cars, which is 1919 to 1930. Then 1930 to 1960 is the classic cars and 1960 onwards is the modern classic cars. There are different ways of dividing them. The American follow a different way, the Europeans follow a different way and the Indian system follows a different way, which I will explain later. So the Edwardian cars are the brass era cars. I will show you pictures of all the four categories and you would realize how cars have changed and what we drive today, these are the basics from where they all started. So the Edwardian cars or the brass era cars are referred to in American, cars, car, in American terms. Called so due to the prominent brass fitting used during the time for such parts like lights, meters, radiators. It is generally considered encompassed from 1896 to 1918, that is the end of World War One. These work vehicles were often referred to as horseless carriages because they weren't engines, they were horses pulling them. Then we have the first series which is the Edwardian car. So you can see the lights, they have the brass lights, the radiator are different and they didn't have a starter system, they had to be churned up to get started. I have taken Cadillacs as my example of cars, so I have only got Cadillacs here and we will go through the Cadillac series. Then we have the vintage car. These cars in general are automobiles manufactured from 1919 to 1930. They could be even till 1940 as per the European system. Basically made after World War One. Lot of companies making this car got shut down after the Great Depression. This is what the Cadillac looks like. So you saw the earlier one which is this in 1905 and now we have reached this and this is got the humongous V16 engine. Then we have the classic cars which I am personally very fond of. The post vintage cars built 1930 onwards is definitely different by different countries. So Europeans would say till 1930 and the Americans will say till 1940. This classic term is also used, like if you see an old car which is pretty looking car, you will say what a nice looking classic car. So it's a very generic term also. 
This is what a 1959 Cadillac looks like. Then we have the modern classics. These are 1960 onwards. They are the future classics. They'll probably become classics when you guys become much older. These vehicles are generally 15 to 25 years old. Not accepted as classic cars by the American club. And it's a very selective list. So any car which is about 25 years will not form a list. It's a selective list, a very exclusive list, not an exhaustive list. So this is what a 1969 Cadillac looks like. So now we'll just see the difference. From here we started 1905, 1930, 1959 and 1969. As per the vintage and classic car clubs of India, antique cars are pre-1920, vintage cars are 1920 to 1940, classic cars are 1940 to 1960 and modern classics are 1960 onwards. I had picked up this car. In fact, uh, Tutu sir, who was just talking to you, was the first person to restore the car. So I'll just take you very quickly of the whole process of this particular car. This is a Daimler Dart. It's a Daimler SP250, 1959 model. It's a fiberglass body, all four disc brakes, and is the only surviving Daimler SP250 in the country. This is during the restoration work. That's the engine, so it's a V8 block and the engine is also, so the car does not have to look nice only from the outside. The, the speciality of these vintage cars is that they look nice from the engine bay as well. And this is the car winning a prize at the, at the famous Cartier event in Delhi. Now we'll talk about the key ingredients very very quickly because Tutu Sir has given a very thorough explanation of how to restore a car. So firstly, it's about the knowledge. You have to have the correct specialized manpower. For me, I would just go to Tutu Sir. <coughs> Obviously, there's a lot of time because sometimes you get stuck on, on a particular part and then you're unable to work away from that. It costs money, definitely. <coughs> patience and a lot of patience. And most importantly, I feel, is the love for the automobile. Do's and do's, don'ts of restoration. Keep it simple. You don't have to make the car look very, very fancy. You have to go back to the basics. Try and get the original papers, see what the original color and how the car looked back in the day and try moving towards that. Most important thing is you have a lot of information on cars but reading the right information is key. Never throw a part. Try and keep the old part. Try and restore that part. If a part is missing, try and get the old refurbished one instead of buying a new one. This is what a bill sheet looks like. This is of a Rolls Royce uh, ordered in, on 28 May 1929. You can't read the details, but it will give you the full details of the car. So you have to go back to the various clubs and they will give you the information and that's how you restore these cars. Now after the restoration work is done, maintenance is as important. So once the car is restored, maintaining it is just as important trick is to drive it as much. If you leave, even, even if you park your normal car for about a month and if you try and starting it, it will not start. So these are old cars. They have to be driven, driven regularly. Storage in safe place. Humidity is definitely the biggest enemy but luckily in Rajasthan we are, we are safe from that. Has to be safe from rain, sun and rodents etc. But what happens, which, what kind of vintage cars should one buy? Like all of you when you look at cars tomorrow, you'll feel like, okay, I like this particular car, I like that particular car. So some people, like uh, Ivy Singh Ji here loves Jeeps. Some people love bikes and some people love, love uh, classic cars like which are convertible. Some people like coupe. So personally, I like convertibles. But you have the option of buying a convertible, a saloon, a coupe, a limousine, an off-road vehicle or a muscle car. You may have a... Uh, a country specific love also like Alan, uh, Mr. Goenka who gives his cars to Alan to look after, he's got this whole love for the Buick, so he's got the most amazing collection of American Buicks. Rarity is definitely the key, the rarer the car the more precious it is. When buying a car you have to definitely study the papers well because you know you want to have a car which is safe and the papers are clean. What is fun about vintage cars is that it's a passion, at the same time it's also an investment because the prices appreciate. But it is buying at the right time. If you buy an unrestored car, it is definitely cheaper. It can be restored as per your liking. 
it appreciates multifold because it's also the effort you put in. Also, India has lesser vintage and classic cars compared to the world market because we never manufactured them. They were all imported into India. And now you are allowed to import these cars but they are pre-1950 only and you have to pay 200% duty on them. So we'll play a little guess game. This was the last record of a auction and this particular 1963 Ferrari 250 GTO was sold for 410 crores in 2018. This record was broken last year. Can you guess the price of the record? Anyone? Anyone, anyone except who hasn't seen my presentation? Just some, just some, just throw some figures at me. The record is 410 for one car. What do you think the record would be? Not even close. 1100 crores for one car. And look at the car, it's beautiful. You see any modern car, you talk about Ferraris and Lamborghinis and the Works and the McLarens. I don't think they stand anywhere next to this. So that is what classic cars are all about. They are appreciating assets, you enjoy them, you love them and they appreciate. What more do you want in, in your hobby? So this is a graph, you can see how the appreciation and how the prices are going up. So you are having a hobby, you are driving the hobby, you are having fun with the car and at the same time when you stare at the car it's appreciating. These are some comparisons, so in any, if you invest money in gold, in wine, in different sorts of things, you can see the last column is cars. So if you compare 12 months, 6 years and 10 years, cars are almost winning in all sectors. Some famous car collectors are Jay Leno, Bulgari, Ralph Lauren, Sultan of Brunei, Lewis Hamilton, Jerry Seinfeld, Rowan Orbinson, who is normally known as Mr. Bean. Thank you. What we'll now do is, uh, to do sir, me and Alan will be on the podium and any questions, we'll take them because I'm sure you guys are hungry. I was a mayor white, so you know, I would keep staring at my watch as well when we had these presentations. So we'll do a quick round of presentation, uh, quick round of question and answers and then all of you can have dinner. Alan, sir. So we'll take questions now. Any questions about cars or anything? Tutu sir is here. I'm sure you see him on TV, so you can throw questions at him. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. My name is Akshay. So I was asking, what is the approx cost for restoration? Some more expensive, uh, you go into more detail. So, I'll give you a ballpark figure. A restoration in today's day and age can start from around 15 lakhs and probably go up to a crore and a half. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Sir, 
My name is Lakshirasan Rajahot and my question is, what do you think that the, who will take over the market, the motorcycles or the cars? Avijit uh, collects motorcycles and cars. So, Avijit. Your question is again, can you repeat the question? Who will take over the market, motorcycles or cars? You are talking about vintage or the new ones? Sir, all types. All types. It depends. See, personally, uh, when you travel abroad and you see these motorcycle people and they are driving around in their fancy bikes around some nice roads, so they have a cult value and they have this whole uh, aura around them. India works differently that even if you are in an expensive bike and you are roaming around, the traffic scenario does not, uh, does not help you and does not make you have fun with the bike because the weather is such. Also the four wheelers I personally feel do not respect two wheelers. So personally I like both, I like two wheelers and four wheelers. But uh, there is no competition between the two. I mean the car world is a different world and the bike world is a different world. So they, they are both happy in their world. So there is, they can't, it's a wrong comparison if I may say because you can't compare the two wheeler people and the four wheel people. And uh, they, they both have their own world, they are happy in their old world. Definitely in India, I would choose a four wheel because of the comfort and the scenario and also there is more fun in a four wheel drive car. But two, -wheel, two wheelers are also fun. So it's your personal choice at the end of the day. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. So my name is Shayaz and my question is, so I've seen a lot of people around me talk about cars. So how do you actually build up an interest in learning about cars? See, it's all about, you're, you're asking me, how do you take interest in cars? It's something which is, which you're probably born with. Some people are fond of cars, some people are fond of art, some people are fond of, there are so many things, sports, tennis, swimming, etc. So it's a passion and passion cannot be inculcated. You're born with it. For me, if I put my example in that, the first word, when I was born, which was, when I was probably like a month or whenever I took my, whenever I spoke my first word was Jeep. So, you know, it was something which I was born with. And I've taken my passion ahead. I've tried to merge my business and my passion together. Although it's a side hobby, it's not my main hobby. And for example, Tutu sir here, he is passionate about cars from the beginning. And what more do you want in life where you're going to work where your passion is there. So he is not going to work for, he is not going to work, he is going to his passion. And your passion, your business, your hobby, if all three are together, you are in the best dream world possible. I will just add a few words to Avijit. Uh, this is uh, my own experience, I am saying. I got fascinated with anything mechanical, starting from even opening watches and cameras and so on and so forth. Finally, I ended up what I am doing here for the last 60 years. And let me tell you, I have not worked. I have only gone to a hobby center for the last 60 years and just enjoyed. Enjoyed doing what I wanted and I still enjoy doing it. So it is not necessary that my prodigy will also follow what I am doing. I have got six grandchildren. One grandson of mine here does not want to talk about cars, he just wants to talk about ball, football, cricket ball, that's all, nothing else. And there is another grandson of mine who talks only of cars, but he wants the best cars. He wants the Rolls Royces, Ferraris and so on, but he doesn't want to clean them, he doesn't want to wash them. So it's, it's just a way of life. So you can't generalize by saying, that I will also have passionate prodigy who would go forward. But yes, there would be some people like me. I was born in a family of uh, 20 odd cousins and uh, uncles and so on. The only one who went into, I would not call it business, I went into a passion. Everybody else was in service. So there is no generalization at all. If I might, I'd also like to add something on this topic. Uh, 
I also go to work as a hobby. It's a hobby place for me. It's 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 called Hobby Central among my friends, and they all come there. And a lot of times, I get asked this question as to how did I get into automobile restoration? Uh, frankly, I also was born, and I all think that I have cars running in my blood. Uh, I was racing when I was barely, I think I was 13, we were doing karting, then I went on to racing on the track and uh, then I was off-roading a lot but uh, dad was very, was in the, was a mechanical engineer so he wanted me to do mechanical engineering and then he wanted me to go on the ship. So I did my marine engineering and I finally, I asked dad that you know I want to do something with cars but he was like what should you do with cars and is there money in cars, is, uh, is there a future? And I never had an answer then. So I said, okay, let's go his way. And I joined marine engineering. I did my whole course. I sailed for four years as a fifth engineer. Then I got promoted to a fourth engineer. And then somewhere it struck me that, I mean, it's cars. It's cars that I love doing. So I, I mean, I asked dad. I gave up uh, shipping. And then I joined with one of my uncles who's a very big collector. We opened this restoration shop. And I think now it's about 14 years that we are running the shop and we do churn out some really pretty cars. Uh, so I mean, to, just to conclude, I think to have that interest in cars, it should be imbibed in you and uh, it's something that comes right from the beginning, from the time you're born. Uh, I'm Kavin and my question would be why vintage cars, not newer cars like you could also do uh, modifications in JDM cars and even there are rare cars in other aspects like the A86 or the Mark I Supra and all that. I personally collect a lot of cars that you've mentioned so because I've grown up seeing cars of the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, they are lovely cars, they drive well, they have AC, they have power steering, but they are mechanically advanced and the cars that, I mean, I like working on are uh, more down to earth, very basic, less electronics and that excites me. So for me, the excitement is that the cars are so primitive, you learn a lot and, uh, and there's a huge market also now. If I, if I may add on to that, when you come with a vintage car or a classic car to, to any of the people here on my right, they will hear the car, they will feel something from the car and then they'll work out what is wrong with it. The new car, all you do is put a scanner in, the scanner will show you what is wrong and it will be sorted. So there is no attachment. Yes, uh, for vintage and classic cars, I'd like to add something more is that they have an identity of their own when you are talking of any vintage or classic car. From a far off area you can identify what car is coming or what car has gone. Whereas in a modern car, as I said earlier also, they are all balloon shaped, elongated balloon with a badge sticking on the bonnet and one at the boot and you can interchange and, and you can't make out if somebody has done a job on you. So it's is, is basically an identity and of course the other thing is the the artwork that has gone into building that old vintage and classic car they are all outstanding if you see each of them individually you will you can make out that there is some artwork and creativeness gone into building a car like that Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Jebi. I study in class 8 and I would like to know that how many vintage cars do you own and what is your favorite one? Here, sir. I'm going to skip the question of how many cars I own, but I will answer the question of which is my favorite is the toughest question ever. All of them are my favorite. I love each and every car of mine because all of them have some sp uh, story to speak. It's like you are having, obviously none of us have that, it's like you are having 15-20 children and your parents are asked which is your favorite kid. 
So all of them are equal. Similarly, for me, all my cars are equal. prettiest ones in India. Uh, they are difficult to maintain, especially in our country with the heat. Uh, but apart from that, in terms of value, they have soared. I think they're breaking all records in India also at the moment and a few more are coming into the country. So I think vintage air cool Porsches are, uh, I mean, one of the best things to do if you're collecting cars, classic cars. What was the second part? How much time do we take? So, uh, a thorough restoration would, at our setup, take about minimum a year to if we are doing something that's going for Pebble Beach to two years to two and a half years. Our director, General Surendra Kulkarni, to present a token of our appreciation and gratitude to the distinguished guests and address the gathering thereafter. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dhawan, Alan, and Abhiji, thank you very much for enlightening all of us on something that deep down inside we may not have a passion, but we all have a fascination for. Uh, the trouble with some of the younger generation is uh, they associate class with fast cars. 
Uh, let me also tell you a little secret because many of you are seniors here with a lot of interest across the road. The slower you drive your car, the longer you get a look. And if you go zooming past, it's no good. And for those of you who are asking about bikes, uh, even in India you have you have these Harley groups, you know, the hogs as they call them. Remember what is fascinating and exciting to many of, not the real serious guys, but those who are just curious, is not really the bike so much, but all the accessories that go with it, including the, you know, air cooled helmet and all the other stuff. So please remember, Focus on the real stuff, not on the accessories, not on the frills and fancy stuff. And Aviji just reminded me, last year we restored our clock. And remember, this has got the same machinery like the Big Ben. And somebody suggested to us that, look, this is a very laborious process. And why do you want to go through this? We'll put a digital thing at the back. And the hands and all will look all the same. Nobody will know any difference. And I said, no, not on my watch. It's not happening. We want the real original Mayo stuff. So the same thing goes with vintage and classic cars. You got to go back to the real stuff. And the new cars are fascinating science-wise. So the old cars have a great combination of what science was available then and a great sense of art. So you will find those handcrafted things are absolutely unique. And tomorrow, many of you get a chance to go and see the cars and the jeeps and other vehicles. Please spend some time and try and understand the nuances, what is the difference between one and the other. And though uh, Avi said it is something innate, no, I think you can carve out a passion. But if you carve out a passion in life, remember a passion without perseverance is no passion. And all these guys, you, can, you could hear it in their voices. You know, their, their hearts, minds, souls, everything is with the cars. So if you really want to have any hobby, any hobby, doesn't matter which one, if you don't have passion, you won't be a serious hobby. And if it's a serious hobby, you need to persevere. So my request to all of you guys, don't go by the flavor of the month. Look around and see what fascinates you. Pick up a hobby, which as all of them have said, remains a hobby, but also turns out to be a vocation. And as... Uh, Many of you understand business and you come from such families. He showed you the lovely charts, Avijit. Your investment in such an activity will always give you higher returns than everything else. For us, this initiative of having this winter car rally in intangible terms has given us outstanding return on investment on what we do with our children. And I want to particularly thank Arjav, Pradyum and all the other Auto Club members for coming up with this and doing a great job of it. I, I don't think I'm exaggerating if I say that this is perhaps the first school in India and a boarding school at that which has taken the initiative and actually pulled it off. And I'm grateful to all the car owners and others who have contributed their cars and I counted this morning there were 29 of them. I think that's an amazing number. Apart from our own school and the girls' school and the youth school, and of course a handful of local schools, we are very fortunate that we are also having an MUN at the MCGS, and I have requested them that tomorrow morning, children of other schools who have come for the MUN must also come and witness the cars at the central field. It's not just to see the cars. It is for them to turn them completely green with envy that Mayo can do what their schools can't even imagine they can. So well done boys, I'm proud of you. I think, uh, where is my friend from Jashpur? He's here today or not here? He was here in the morning. He's gone? The young boy from Jashpur. In he was a student till last year. Anyway, he was telling me, he says, sir, I still remember your words very often that you said we don't have competition because we don't recognize rivals. Because we just position ourselves above and beyond the competition. 
and that has to be the mindset and spirit of a good mayorite. Is that okay, you all young guys at the back? You're going to be fighting rivals or you're going to be above the competition? I heard you so loudly, so loudly that even your neighbor hasn't heard you. So okay, then I'm going to now ask you to say something which comes easy to you, but if it is not heard in the girls' school, in their principal's dinner for the MUN, then you guys are useless. So, let's chant, Go Mayo! Go Mayo! Now they're wondering, what is that noise? So, second time, Go Mayo! Go Mayo! And the third time, Rocket, Go Mayo! Go Mayo! Did you hear the peacocks also resonated? Our peacocks also answer. So, I know uh, Avijit mentioned that when it's dinner time and food time, then my kids' minds go there. And he was actually blaming all you guys for it. Actually, he's a diehard Mayoite. And because it is past his time, so he was trying to tell you that you must wind up on, in, in good time. But I'm grateful that in this short time, the presentations that you made were so informative, both the presentations, so easy to understand, and so systematically laid out. And of course, Alan has promised you all sorts of things. So the next time we go to Mumbai, Goa and those places, one of the visits is going to be to your place. All right? So once again, thank you all three of you. We are very grateful to all of you. And to all the others who have come in their cars, we are extremely grateful. Without your unconditional support and backing of my kids, this would have never happened. And once again, the loudest cheer to the Auto Club. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. On behalf of Mayo College, I would like to take this opportunity to express our heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guests for taking out time from their busy schedule for, and for making this day momentous. We are grateful to our senior functionaries for their support. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Students, to remain seated while the guests depart. <laughs>